Friends, at this time we are going to begin services for Sarah Cohn. I'd ask if anyone has a cell phone or any other noise-making device, if you'd please take a moment at this time to turn it off or place it in the silent mode. Officiating services today is Rabbi Rachel Weiss and Cantor Howard Friedland with the <clears throat> Reconstructionist, Jewish Reconstructionist Congregation. We sit together this morning in so much sadness and so much love. The Water is Wide, a piece of music that Sarah loved, sets the tone for this morning. Give me, the water is wide, I can't cross over, but neither I have wings to fly. Give me a boat that will carry me through, and both shall row, my love and I.
This is a day that happened too soon and too fast. And like the grayness and cloudiness outside, the world is crying with us. We are here acknowledging the reality that our beloved Sarah Cohn has died. And as someone who fought so long and was such a strong doer and someone whose presence was always about being in the world, it is hard to imagine that now she is not. And we gather here this morning, this morning in our collective brokenness to be here with all of our arms around Stan and Rachel and Jacob and Judy and Andrew and Andrew and all of us because when you knew Sarah Cohen, she brought you into her home and her heart like family. We learned of Sarah's transition into hospice at the end of Simchat Torah, as many of us, Rachel and I and Andrew together and Cantor Howard were dancing in the streets with the Torah, arriving at this moment of endings and beginnings. And that evening, after the service and the revelry, she transitioned into hospice. This past Shabbat was Shabbat Breshit, the Shabbat of beginning again. And it was this Shabbat, early, early in the morning, that Sarah left this world. For many of us who knew Sarah for many, many years in many iterations, the last six years of seeing her walk through the door with a very coordinated hat or scarf, with a smile and a warmth and a, I'm okay, <laughs> as she walked in. And those of us that saw her in these final days as she was slipping from the world, it is hard to imagine Sarah in all of her vibrancy the images of the end of life as cancer is very difficult. So I invite you in this moment to hold an image in your mind of the very first time you ever met Sarah Cohn. She might have been with you before you had cognizant memories <laughs> or the very first memory you have, the way in which you saw her then, the joy, the welcome, the hospitality that she brought into your life. Whether it was coming through the door at the synagogue or a gala meeting or opening up her home or spending time sitting in the sukkah together or simply just being there and to hold this moment, this image in your mind of Sarah not just the way she left this world, but all of the ways that she filled it. Sarah spent time during Sukkot sitting with friends in the sukkah. It's hard to believe as we sat to plan her funeral in that same space that a week before she had been sitting with some of you eating french fries and sitting in the sukkah outside. The holiday that reminds us that nothing is permanent and none of us will last forever. These words of Kohelet, of Ecclesiastes, that we chant, that says, we are but a drop in the largest of waters, and we'll return to the waters, and the waters will go on without us. And while it is our time here, those of us here, us the living, we carry her with us as we continue to tell Sarah's story from Kohelet, the book of Ecclesiastes. Dor honech, dor ba, ve'aretz l'olam ma'adet. Nizarech ha-shemesh uva-ha-shemesh ve'el mikomo shoif 
As we'll hear later, Sarah grew up in an intentional community, and her foundation of hospitality and community was bred into her from the very beginning. And being a friend, being a member of a community was such an important part of her life. Over these last two days, more than 30 members of her community came here to sit with her in the practice of Shmirah to sit and accompany her body, to take care, to tell and to pray how much Sarah meant to all of us. We are blessed to be able to hear so many of the stories, both here and through this week of Shiva. I want to invite her dear friend, Lisa Friedman, to share with us now some of your memories and thoughts, your reflections about your relationship with Sarah. Good morning. My husband Mark and our son Jordan and I met Sarah and Stan and Rachel and Jacob about 23 years ago when we first moved to Skokie. Although our friendship began as a result of joining their temple, I was also Rachel and Jacob's elementary school music teacher. And as I look around here today, there are several of my former students. Over the last several days, I've been trying to decide what to say today. My problem has been narrowing down all of the wonderful qualities that would describe Sarah. But when I think about her, what comes to mind over and over is what a good woman she was. Sarah was selfless, always putting others first, regardless of what she was going through. About two and a half years ago, while I was recovering from surgery, Sarah would come to visit me at, at home almost every day for about a month. She would be so tired from chemo, but she would ring my doorbell no matter how often I would tell her to stay home and rest. No, she would say, I am coming over. So she would make us tea. She would sit on the couch and we would chat until she eventually closed her eyes and took a little nap. That was Sarah, so caring and loving and a blessing each and every day. I know that Sarah's kindness and generosity and love for her family and friends is the common thread in many of our eulogies today. But as far as I'm concerned, it can't be stated too often. There never has been nor will there ever be anyone as brave, selfless, and loving as our dear Sarah. Over the 20 plus years that I was privileged to be Sarah's friend, she taught me so much about living and loving. And I can also say that other mutual friends here today have all said the same. We loved her deeply, and it is going to be so difficult to no longer have her in our lives, but because of her goodness, she made a difference in our lives 
and we will carry that with us throughout our remaining days. I will end with the lyrics of a beautiful song, sung, song by Stephen Schwartz that makes, that speaks to our feelings for Sarah. I've heard it said that people come into our lives for a reason, bringing something we must learn and we are led to those who help us most to grow if we let them. And we help them in return. I don't know if I believe that's true. But I know, but I know I'm who I am today because I knew you. Like a comet pulled from orbit as it passes the sun, like a stream that meets a boulder halfway through the wood. Who can say if I've been changed for the better? But because I knew you, I have been changed for good. It well may be that we will never meet again in this lifetime. So let me say before we part, so much of me is made of what I learned from you. You'll be with me like a handprint in my heart. And now, whatever way our stories end, I know you have rewritten mine by having been my friend. Who can say if I've been changed for the better? I believe I've been changed for the better. Because I knew you. Because we knew you, Sarah. We have been changed for good. And for the last time, my sweetheart, darling, I love you. The 23rd Psalm. Mizmole David, Adonai Rohi Loaxar, Minot Dashe Yarbitseni, Almen Nohot, Almen Nohot. Oh, no. 
Nancy Woods wrote, hold on to what is good, even if it is a handful of earth. Hold on to what you believe, even if it's a tree which stands by itself. Hold on to what you must do, even if it is a long way from here. Hold on to life, even when it is easier letting go. Hold on to my hand, even when I have gone from you. Rachel and Jacob, we invite you to share your words about your mother as she held your hands through so much of your life, and at the end of her life, you held hers. There was a time when we were kids, when we were on vacation in Puerto Rico, kayaking on a bioluminescent bay. More water, I didn't even make the connection with the water is wide thing, but here we are. Um, the evening was magical. We paddled through the water with silver streaks made by glow-in-the-dark algae that lit up as we moved our hands or the oars through the water. Naturally, my dad, the algae scientist, thought this was fantastic, as did I. The part I've been remembering most in recent days was at the end of the kayaking trip, when my parents realized that somehow on this magical journey, our rental car keys had dropped into the water. <laughs> we waited with our kayaking guides for a while until someone could arrive with a spare from the central office in San Juan. I don't remember how late it was or feeling cold in the chilled evening air. All I remember was the extra time we got to spend together. How, despite the fact that there was an inconvenience and a slight language barrier, the only thing that came across to me was the joy in the family time. We got to chat with our cool guides. We got to joke about which underwater creatures might soon have access to our rental car. We got to spend even more time in the beautiful night sky on this peaceful, luminous coast. And that's how my mom was. She found a way to bring goodness and joy to any situation. We could have been anywhere, car broken down on the highway, camping in the rain, editing a paper of mine late at night. It didn't matter because her bright energy and can-do spirit made any time together full of possibility. There were countless road trips, vacations to see family in other states, Girl Scout troop meetings, school craft projects, surprise sewing alterations. She took these on with love and gave love back in the way that she did them. She was a second mother to many, including many folks in the room here today, people who knew her for a few minutes or many years have been reaching out, saying how much they appreciated her. She was a bright light in my childhood. I remember her warmth and perfect hugs. I was always proud to share her. Even when she was facing cancer, she was the same way, always spreading goodness. By an unexpected set of circumstances, I was present with my mom and dad at the appointment where she got her cancer diagnosis. When we got back home, still stunned and processing the news, she said something like, don't worry, this won't get me. While none of us had control in the end over whether the cancer would take her body, she was really right that the illness did not get her. It did not take her life force. It did not take her spirit. It did not take her love. She did a hell of a lot of living in those six and a half years of living with cancer. She got to see me and Andrew get married in the woods of Connecticut. She got to see Jacob living and working at Orrin Moore in Missouri, part of a beautiful family who she swiftly welcomed as her own. She got to see me start the journey towards becoming a rabbi. 
She got to spend time in retirement with my dad when they had travel adventures and even made watching TV together look like a date night. She got to see me become a mother. She got to hold our son Ari the first day he was born and offer us invaluable support in those early months of new parenthood. She would take over after sleepless nights saying, I need my morning snuggles. She got to see Ari grow into the delightful toddler he is, who loves his Gemma and will be part of keeping, his memory, of keeping her memory alive. She got to celebrate her 66th birthday and one more round of Jewish high holidays with us, eating and laughing with her friends in the sukkah even just a little while ago, as Rabbi Weiss mentioned. Her life during this time wasn't defined by any of those moments, but by the understanding that life is precious and none of these milestones could be taken for granted. She hugged us closer, didn't sweat the small stuff, and relentlessly kept looking forward to the next joyous occasion. She died on Shabbat late at night after we had gathered with family for blessings. I've been thinking about the words of the Hashki Venu prayer we say on Friday nights or any other night, asking for protection. Hashki Venu Adonai Eloheinu Shalom, God help us lie down in peace. Spread over us the shelter of your peace. Raise us up our protector to life. I hope her spirit is finding deep comfort and peace in this transition. And as for raising her up, I think that is on all of us right now, to take a piece of her goodness and honor her in our own lives. We'll miss her terribly. We might all feel like we are kayaking in the dark right now, like that radiant bay where there might still be a fish looking for the right Honda. <laughs> I imagine if my mom had anything to say about it, she'd be watching us and nudging us to keep paddling forward to look for the light, the light that sometimes you can only see in the darkness. And maybe we'll even see her in some of those silver shining streaks. I didn't, I didn't write anything down for this, so uh, forgive me if I uh, fumble and flounder a little bit. Uh, but my mom is uh, a master weaver, and I was. <clears throat> I was trying to think of what to say and just there's I mean there's just been so many feelings and I was just sitting with the feeling of her and it, something I kept coming back to was the cloth and the fabric and She's, she's done so much for me and for so many people. The memory that kept coming back when I could feel her love so much was all these memories had to do with sewing and fabric. <clears throat> I, I remember her sewing stuffed animals for me and mending my clothes and uh, especially one time I was back home and I, you know, I was, I felt lost and I was trying to find myself in the woods and I, I was wearing a big baggy sweater and <clears throat> when I got back out of the walk I was covered in burrs and stickers and uh, I came back and I was like, I don't know what, <laughs> this <clears throat> is a lot. And she was, she was just so happy to, to pick all of the stickers off. <laughs> and uh, she, her, her love language was always acts of service. And uh, 
you know, is whether it was small things or big things. But I realized that I think those memories meant so much to me and like felt so powerful to me and as a metaphor now because she always wanted to repair the world and like mend the fabric of our universe. Anytime, anytime like my, the, the fabric of my life was becoming unraveled or torn, she, she was always so ready to do whatever it was to help me. I know that was true for her. for everyone she touched. I'm so grateful for her. I can feel her spirit flying. I know she would want us to be, to feel joy and continue leaving our lives together and repairing the world. I love her so much and I'm so glad that she was my mom. One of these gifts in this last week was Rachel and Jacob and Stan all sitting together with Sarah and all of you being able to be together. Stan, I want to welcome you to share what are probably the hardest words. How, how can you even begin to describe Sarah? How can you even start to condense a lifetime of compassion and love? Um, I want to start by mentioning one little snippet that epitomized her caring. Eighteen months ago, when Sarah's liver began to fail and uh, the oncologist sat us down and said that unless this new drug we were about to try worked, Sarah probably only had another month or two to live. And he started tearing up as he said it. And Sarah immediately got the nearby box of Kleenex, <laughs> handed it to him, and said, here, this must be very hard on you. <laughs> it was no different when she got her first diagnosis. Uh, we were talking together and I told her that it was completely unfair for her. And she replied that no. <sighs> Whatever happened to her, it would happen, but it was unfair for me to have to come along for the ride. It's the way she spent her entire life, trying to make things better for others. Our family was talking the other night about how Sarah always was able to bring people together. And even now in her death, she brought all of you here today in an act of love that means more, than, more to our family than you'll ever know. Sarah had an innate sense of the best ways to care for and comfort people. 
was always kind and gentle, but she was also very strong and resilient and a fighter and was more than happy to wear the badass jacket that, that was in quotes, it has badass on it. <laughs> her friends got for her after she got her diagnosis. My good friend Michael Rosenberg has taught me that people become drawn to certain Jewish values that feel just right for them. Sarah was drawn to more than a few. Baal Tashit, do not waste. Sarah did not want to waste anything that might provide use. Rubber bands, plastic bags, paper bags, cardboard boxes, doohickeys, thingamabobs, and tons of Bed Bath & Beyond coupons. <laughs> we, we have them all. Nothing that might still have a purpose should be wasted. But far beyond those items, she knew the most important thing of all not to waste was time. She knew er she knew that every second, every moment was a precious gift. Time was a treasure never to waste. She had a work ethic that was calm and steady and tempered with an understanding of the importance of the non-work time with family and friends. She knew that every day should be held tight with an attempt to fill the day with accomplishment, enjoyment, and appreciation. When the pandemic hit and when her health deteriorated some, she still wanted to make sure that the two of us spent time together, even if the time together was just watching TV. And we both quickly cherished this time together. Solid streaming of Psych, Monk, My Favorite Martian, Murder, She Wrote, and most importantly, our daily dose of The Price is Right. We enjoyed those moments as much as our trip to the Galapagos several years before. Haknasad Arkim, hospitality. Sarah wanted to, everyone who came through our house to feel accepted, welcomed, and comfortable. Every time people were coming over to our house, she quickly assessed the needs. Which would be the foods most enjoyed by those people? What kind of drinks did they like? Um, what was the best way to ensure that everything that we had might be uh, quickly available so that no one would need to ask for a thing? One of her great joys was to have people have an enjoyable space where they felt relaxed, taken care of, and free to be themselves. Kvod Habriot, human dignity. Sarah felt the deep core worth of every person and the need to always treat every person she met with dignity and respect. Every person she ever met was treated with the same care, compassion, and honor. Every person was of infinite worth just the way they were. This was one of the many reasons she was so wonderful with children. Being part of special education teams as a school psychologist, she knew that children, regardless of their needs and abilities, should be given the same love, acceptance, and respect. Children could always sense her kindness, and whatever family event we went to, she made sure to bring some things that the children could do, cookie decorating, craft projects, books. Every child should be shown care and respect. Imuna, trustworthiness. She valued her family and her friends and colleagues and always acted in ways that displayed her honor and honesty and integrity. She was always tactful but could always be counted on to tell the truth. She was loyal, dependable, and always honest. Kahila, community. Growing up in that small intentional community, Sarah always knew the sense of personal responsibility in doing what needed to be done to improve the community, especially when there was an unfulfilled need. When called on, she virtually always said, Hinani, here I am. She ended up running the monthly Shabbat dinners at Niles Township congregation, starting a Girl Scout troop, becoming a soccer referee for AYSO, running the galas at JRC, and so much more. If she saw a need, she was there. She knew that a community 
is only as strong as the support you give it. Dugmashit, role modeling and leading by example. Sarah lived her life in a way that she could always be an example to family and others. She never asked others to do things that she wasn't willing to do, but even more so, she had an insight into people to encourage them to be the best that they could be. In my own case, she always knew the things that meshed with my interest and abilities and when to give me that needed push to do things I would otherwise be hesitant to do. From the moment we met, and she gave me that little extra oomph to finish my thesis, to encourage me to run Tachabot services at Niles Township, helping to run the Niles Township family retreats, helping to run the children's services High Holy Days at JRC, and even joining the Purim Spielers. Sarah was the one behind all those. She never told people what to do, but she always encouraged them to be the best in themselves. She knew what people had inside of them and always had to help them bring it out. Hakarat Hatov, gratitude. She was grateful for every moment of every day. Especially since her diagnosis, she was filled with gratitude for the time, for the friends, for the family, for the tireless doctors and the nurses that were helping her, for sunny blue skies or cloudy rainy days, for every blessing that came her way, for the miracle of her last year of life and the ability to play with little Arye and see his first and second birthday, for the time to witness the amazing things her children were doing, Almost a year ago, we started a practice of giving gratitude to each other every night for the blessings of one more day together. Most of her last words during the last trip to the hospital were thank yous she gave to all of the nurses she encountered. A couple of months ago, when I picked up lunch for her, when she was having an appointment there and trying to find the room where she was in, I would be asking the nurses, you know, which, which room, and I was overwhelmed with the outpouring of love for Sarah from all the nurses and staff. They all said, oh, Sarah. <laughs> when I told her how much they cared about her, she said, oh, it's no big deal. It's probably just because I'm nice to them for what they do. And speaking of gratitude, I'm sure Sarah would think I was remiss if I didn't let all of you know how grateful we are for having you here with us today. Both all of those of you who've come to this space and for all of those of you watching. For your love, your support, and your friendship. And how very grateful she was to her amazing oncologist, Dr. Campbell, who was by her side every step of the way, along with all the doctors and nurses at the Kellogg Center and University of Chicago. On the day we got married, in that private time after the ceremony, I told Sarah, I know now that I will only have one regret in life, and that is that I will only have one lifetime to share with you. I'm so blessed that she shared her life with me and that for a while she shared her light to help warm my soul.
and understanding among us. Let peace and friendship be our shelter from life's storms. Let there be love and understanding among us. Let peace and friendship be our shelter from life's storms. Shelter and peace and friendship and love. Hospitality, integrity, honesty, and directness. All parts of Sarah Cohn that we will carry with us. I learned some things about Sarah over the last couple of days as I was thinking about when I first came to know her. And my first image of Sarah is sitting on a Sunday morning behind a folding table in the lobby of JRC asking people if they've bought their gala and raffle tickets yet. Not entirely accosting everybody who came out of the elevator or down the stairs, but bringing them in to a hand-lettered sign to say, you should come. She brought us in. Last night for dinner, I had a hot dog and french fries from Poochie's, which I learned was her signature stop after her treatment on the way home. Her date with Stan and Skokie, let's go to Poochie's for a hot dog and fries. I learned that not only was Sarah a big fan with Stan of The Price is Right, but they went to The Price is Right. They were in the audience, they were not selected despite the stories, but they were there together in Los Angeles in that time. I just can picture her with a really big name tag and sitting there smiling. We'll see the pictures at your house later. Sarah was born outside of Philadelphia to Charlotte and Mel Hurwitz with her siblings, Judy and Michael. She lived in an intentional community, which at that point was rural, called Bryn Gwelid, a place that was designed in that kibbutz-like style of everyone participating and taking care of one another. That work ethic of Sarah's of stepping in when something needed to be done was nurtured and grown and cultivated there, along with her ability to identify any plant that was nearby, particularly poison ivy, as well as an understanding of what it meant to raise sheep. Community and sharing was part of her upbringing, and she carried it with her as she left after high school to Brandeis to study psychology and would finish her first degree at Cornell. When she was at UNC Chapel Hill studying for her master's in psychology, a friend of Sarah's and a roommate of Stan's decided that perhaps they would get along well. And she ended a relationship, and as soon as that person had walk, literally walked out of the door of the apartment, not very long after, the phone rang like something out of a movie, and it was Stan. <laughs> and they talked for hours long distance, and in a time before we shared every moment in photo and video instantaneously, Stan did not have a picture of himself at the ready, for all of the photos he was taking were slides, and so he sent, them some of those, sent her some of those slides, which were of his algae. <laughs> Sarah saw the algae before she saw Stan. 
<laughs> and together, the two of you pursuing your doctorates in psychology, in biology, were the pair where you would be by each other's side, sitting and writing in the lab, or her sitting at the Purim spiel, scrolling down so everybody could see the words of the Purim spiel that Stan had so lovingly written. She continued to be that ever-present presence. We talk so often at JRC about the mitzvah of showing up, of being there for your community, for your family, for your friends, and Sarah was a, a walking embodiment. And she wouldn't just show up when it was easy. That badass jacket was actually a moniker she earned much earlier because she was the one who would talk honestly with the administration of the school district as a psychologist when nobody else had the guts to do so. Much of the administration, the principal of the schools she worked in, in the River Trail School District, called her her conscience, because Sarah had a way of talking to say, you really should do this differently, and they would listen. Sarah had that work ethic of doing what needed to be done. All of the different ways she would show up when they needed AYSO soccer coaches. And I did not know this, but she not only was a soccer referee when the kids were little, but after the kids played, and continuing even up to the time of her diagnosis, she continued to referee on the soccer field, only stopping because her doc doctor was concerned about fractures. But she stepped in, in interviewing a caretaker for the kids when they were little, she discovered someone who would have been lovely but didn't speak enough English. And so instead of just simply saying, no, this isn't the right job, she said, but I'm happy to help you learn, and became the English tutor for your dear and dear friends, Danuta, for her son, as they learned English and became part of your extended family. That's how Sarah brought people in. She, she engaged in so many different ways. She pushed to do the right thing, and she did it with joy. In the last couple of years with her dear friend, Jeannie Sashnik, also of blessed memory, Sarah and Jeannie ran the gala. We have now lost both of them to cancer this year. And Sarah was by Jeannie's side and Ron's side, and Sarah and Stan were always caring for how she was doing, and the two of them had so much fun together. We will have to continue to make the fun and the excitement and the joy in their memories. Sarah shared her feelings, as Jacob said, by doing. We all know that the mushy one in the family is Stan. He is the one who uses the words and the feelings to share. And Sarah did by being there and giving you the right task and taking it on yourself. She had very high standards. Rachel learned later in her academic career that not everybody had to get a PhD. <laughs> but in your family, you created and modeled parenting and living in a way that was flexible and expansive in your gender roles, and that created a way to express love in lots of different forms. There was so much love in what she did, and sometimes it has taken a while to realize that all of those actions were really her way of saying, I love you. Sarah was a great gift giver. She knew exactly what to get. She spent time figuring out who was the right person and who needed what. The bin of toys in her basement that her kids had long outgrown but you couldn't get rid of because somebody with a child exactly that age might come over sometime and need something to play with. As Sarah began to come to terms with her diagnosis, one of the things that softened was her need to be doing everything. And in that opening, she let others come in and do for her. Her joy in being a partner and a parent and a grandma and a sister and an aunt will echo through your family through all the generations to come. Her fingerprints are not only all over your homes, all over your hearts, 
but they exist in the way that she loved and cared for and with you. She would drop everything at a moment's notice when you needed her to come and be there. And now you're wrapped in the fabric of all of her stories. We carry all of her stories with us, the way that she interacted with us, engaged with us, made us laugh, cooked for us, was there as a friend. And we continue that weaving together of community and of love. And remind ourselves that in the doing and when we step up, it's always also good to say, I love you. And in the saying, I love you, it's also good to step up and take action. We are all so grateful, and I am so grateful, for the life of Sarah Cohn. Her memory will always be a blessing. One of the awarenesses, and as Rachel and I sat and talked this week about what it was like to be with someone as they were slipping away from the world, was a very clear and almost mystical separation of the liturgies that we say, which recognizes Elohai neshama shenatata bi tehorahi, my God, the soul you plant, you, the breath you planted within me is pure. You created it and shaped it and planted it into me, and someday you will take it from me. And in the last week, as we witnessed the separation of Sarah's body and her soul, we are grieving and heartbroken for the loss of her physical presence in this world. And in our broken hearts that are open, her soul ascends, and part of her will always come and rest with us. I invite you to rise in body or in spirit. As we chant El Malay Rachamim, the prayer for Sarah's soul, the essence and beauty of goodness and kindness, that it may rise have safe passage after it was guarded and cared for so lovingly by our community during Shmirah, as we escort her body for burial. Her soul, may it be released, and may we hold on to it. El mare rachamim, I'm <laughs> Anna Barachamim has tireho, beseter can fechale olamim. Utseror, pitro rachaim, et nishmato. Adonai, unacholato. Vitanuach bisholom al mishkalah vinomar amen. God filled with compassion, dwelling in the heaven's heights, bring proper rest beneath the wings of your Shekhinah, amid the ranks of the holy and the pure, illuminating like the brilliance of the skies, the soul of Sarah Cohn, who has gone to her eternal place of rest. May you, who are the source of compassion, shelter her beneath your wings eternally and bind her soul among the living, that she may rest in peace. And we say, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. This concludes this portion of the service here at our chapel. Um, the interment uh, will continue at Shalom Memorial Park as well as the live stream. That'll be at, in Arlington Heights. Later today, the family will be together at the Cone Residence outdoors 
That's 8033 North Trip Avenue in Skokie. That will be this evening starting from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. and continue through Thursday and start again Saturday through Monday, again, 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. and there will be a minion each evening at 6.30 p.m. That information is available inside the folders you received today as you arrived. If you did not receive one, they will be available as you depart. It's also available on our website for those of you who are joining us via live stream. <clears throat> the following have been asked to act as pallbearers today. When I call your name, I'll ask you to please step forward. Andrew Ash, Stephanie Weiss, Ron Deitch, Carol Blechman, Mark Friedman, and Michael Cox. Paul Bears will ask you to step forward and ask everyone to please rise as we escort the family, the clergy, and Mrs. Cohn from the chapel. Friends, we'll ask everyone to gather in around the family under the tent. Obviously, you're welcome to keep as much distance as you're comfortable with. Um, but we will ask everyone to gather around on both sides of the tent, behind the tent, and underneath if you're comfortable. Friends, we are gathered here at the cemetery and also joined by folks who are on the live stream as well as we prepare for one of the most sacred mitzvot of all of them, which is the burial of our beloved. This is one of those moments where we don't mask the reality of what we are doing. It is finite, it is real, it is tangible, and it is hard as we lovingly have accompanied Sarah's body from the moment 
her soul departed and she took her last breath to this moment where we will lay her to rest. And so the mitzvah that we will all take part in in just a moment, anyone who would like to, is to take care of her body, to be here in this moment and to do it. And one of the reasons it is said that we take on this most difficult of tasks and why it's so sacred, because it is not something that can ever be repaid to us by the person that we are honoring. And we do so in quite a simple act of recognizing that just as we take care of Sarah and we bury her body, that someday others will come and take care of us and take care of our bodies. And we are all here. Arie has joined us and we're very, very grateful that his wonderful and loving spirit, because he loved grandma so much and grandma loved him so much that he can be here and give comfort and a little, a little moment of levity, which is not a bad thing amidst this, this moment. We say, al mekova, al mekoma, tavova shalom. May Sarah go to her final resting place in peace. We now prepare to lower her coffin and to take part in the burial. Oh, 
starting with our most immediates with Sarah's immediate family, we invite you to come forth to start the process of her burial. And then anyone who would like to participate, anyone who is here is welcome to step forward and join. The custom is that we shovel multiple times, that we shovel three times because it is an act of intentionality, an act of making sure that with love and attention and intention, we are tending to her burial. And some people choose to use actually the back side of the shovel, which is a symbol of our reluctance to do this task. And the custom so that we do not pass from one to the other is that we put the shovel down in between. So we invite you to come forth as we begin the burial for Sarah. I don't understand why everybody's so sad. Mm -hmm. Check out the bus. Check out the bus. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
In just a moment, a couple of moments. So in just a couple of moments, as everyone who's had an opportunity to participate in the burial does, we'll gather and stand together to say Kaddish for the first time. And so we'll give folks a few more moments. We'll ask people to come together and we'll gather in here to say Kaddish. And then the custom is as we prepare to leave the cemetery, the cemetery staff will uh, do us the, uh, the honor of completing the burial uh, using their equipment. And we're grateful to them for that and for their work and their dedication. And then we as the mourner, as the support to the mourners will form two lines as we lead back out to where the cars are and we'll invite uh, Stan and Rachel and Jacob and Judy and the rest of the family to walk through together as a symbol of our surrounding them at this time. And then Shiva will begin this evening at five o'clock.
So we invite everyone to stand together. If you need the words to Mourner's Kaddish, they are on the back of the pamphlet that you have as we recite these words in Sarah's memory for the first time. And it's all, I, I, I always find it really meaningful to be reminded of the fact that Mourner's Kaddish is actually not a prayer about death. We associate it with death and with loss as we say it at this moment, but the Kaddish, which means the, the holiness or the sanctification, is actually a beautiful blessing that is about the glory and the beauty of life in the world. And it is, may, the, may that which is beautiful, that which is divine, that which is larger than all of us, continue to be glorified and magnified and live beyond us. And the reason we say it as a memorial prayer, as a mourner's prayer, because we say it for Sarah, who is no longer here to say it for herself. It is one of the ways that we continue on and we continue in her memory. We say together, Yit gadal v'yit kadash shemei rabah ve'alma divrach hirutei v'yamlich malchutei v'chayichon uv'yomechon uv'chayei d'chol beit Yisrael v'agala uv'izman kari v'imru. Amen. Yehei shemei rabah mevorach le'olam ulamei almaya Yit barach v'yit tabach v'yit pa'ar v'yit romam v'yit nase v'yit adar v'yit hale v'yit halal shmei d'kudsha b'richu le'ela min kol b'rchata v'shirata tushbachata v'nechamata damiran me'alma v'imru amen yehei shlama raba min shmaya v'chaim aleinu v'el kol yisrael v'imru amen ose shalom b'imromav hu ya'ase shalom aleinu v'el kol yisrael Vel kol yoshvei tevel v'imru amen. Anyone who would like to stay as the family remains to watch as the grave is completely filled is welcome to do so. This does conclude the formal part of our service here at the cemetery. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>